Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and damn it, it happened again. No sooner do I put out what I think is a comprehensive video on a particular subject, than do I come across another artifact that would have been perfect to include in that video, and which adds significantly more to the story. Case in point, a couple of weeks ago, I put out a video on mining safety lamps, and just a few days later, I went to an antique sale and picked up this, a wolf safety lamp. And this includes a bunch of really neat design features that are well worth taking a closer look at. And that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, in case you haven't already seen that previous video, please go do so now because I'm going to be skipping over a lot of the basic design principles of mining lamps in this video. If so, well, let's dive right in. Now, this lamp is based on the patents of one Karl Wolf, who was born in 1838 in Oberhondorf, Kingdom of Saxony. Now, as the son of a miner, Wolf was very aware of the danger posed by fire damp explosions in coal mines. And in 1882, he patented a new type of safety lamp fueled not by oil, but rather benzene. And one of the big problems with traditional oil-fired lamps is that if the flame was allowed to grow too large and become very sooty, then hot particles of soot could potentially escape out through the protective flame arresting mesh and ignite fire damp in the outside atmosphere. Not only did volatile hydrocarbon fuels like benzene significantly reduce this risk, but they also burned with a brighter flame and were much easier to relight using an internal ignition mechanism due to their lower flash point. Now, in 1883, Wolf partnered with brewer and financier Heinrich Schreimann to establish a factory in Zwickau under the name Freimann und Wolf GmbH. And this company was very successful, selling some 7,500 lamps in its first year of operation. And within a couple of years, they had four factories in Germany, as well as foreign subsidiaries, both manufacturers and distributors in Belgium, France, the UK, and the United States. Now, Heinrich Schriemann died in 1898 and Karl Wolf in 1915, whereupon the company was taken over by his son, Paul. And at this point, the company was doing very well. They employed over 2,000 workers and were selling over a million lamps worldwide every year. Unfortunately, the outbreak of the First World War severely affected the company as its foreign subsidiaries were confiscated by their host nations and spun off into independent firms. Very easy to do because at that time, Karl Wolf's original patents had all expired. But the parent company in Germany survived the war and continued to be very successful throughout the 1920s and 30s. Indeed, in 1907, they had come up with their first battery-powered mining lamp, and by the 1930s had become a major European manufacturer of lead-acid and nickel-cadmium storage batteries. Unfortunately, during the Second World War, all of the company's factories in Germany were destroyed by Allied bombing. Though in 1946, the Zwickau plant, now in the Russian zone of occupation, later East Germany, was rebuilt and reorganized as Grubenlampenwerke Zwickau, or GLZ. And this company continued to produce the traditional wolf safety lamp until the 1960s, and other products including batteries, until the late 1980s. In 1984, they changed their name to Grubenlampen und Akkumulatorenwerke Zwickau, later Gerätakkumulatorenwerke Zwickau, or GAZ, and following German reunification, the company was broken up into various smaller companies, most of which still exist today, including GAZ, making Freeman and Wolf one of the oldest original manufacturers of mining safety lamps. Now, this particular example was built by the Wolf Safety Lamp Company Limited, located in Leeds. And while I've not been able to track down an exact manufacturing date for this particular example, Wolf Safety Company only operated in Leeds until 1916, when it was spun off from the parent company in Germany and moved to a new facility in Sheffield. But if any of you watching have access to manufacturing records, here is the serial number stamped on the base, 54194L. So if you're able to work out exactly when this was manufactured, please let me know in the comments. Now, in overall design, this is what's known as a Marceau-style lamp, which is characterized by the protective sheet metal bonnet and the use of multiple nested flame-arresting mesh caps on the inside, which I can access by unthreading the fuel reservoir and pulling out the glass globe, as so. Now, over the years, Friedmann und Wolf and their various subsidiaries produced a wide variety of products, including, as I mentioned before, electric mining lamps and storage batteries, as well as carbide or acetylene lamps. And if you want to learn more about that fascinating technology, please check out my previous video on the subject linked in the description. 
And in terms of traditional flame safety lamps, there are also a number of variations. There were full-size lamps like this one. There are also miniature ones called baby wolf lamps. These were made with both smooth bonnets, which were more popular in Europe, as well as corrugated bonnets, more popular in the United States. These are made out of a number of different materials, including brass, steel, aluminum, and a 50-50 magnesium aluminum alloy called magnalium. They also came with different locking mechanisms. Now, as I mentioned in my previous video on safety lamps, nearly all safety lamps had some sort of locking mechanism to prevent miners from opening them up and relighting them at the coal face and potentially setting off an explosion. This particular lamp has a very simple locking mechanism with a little set screw that's turned by a clock style key. Though other Freeman und Wolf lamps incorporated a locking mechanism that was released using a special magnet. So far, so familiar, but if we take a closer look under the glass globe, then things really start to get interesting. Now, the first component worth pointing out here is this box-like device off to the side. And this is actually the reignition or relighting mechanism. Now, in my previous video, I mentioned two types of relighting mechanisms, a flint and sparker wheel mechanism, as well as electric ignition. But this uses a third type of igniter that I didn't previously know about. So in Wolf's original patents, he describes a percussion igniter, which used a paper or cloth tape covered in little buttons of mercury fulminate, a shock-sensitive primary explosive. And so when you slap a plunger at the bottom of the lamp, it would advance the tape and then strike one of the buttons, setting off the mercury fulminate and lighting the wick. Now, this was likely derived from the Maynard tape primer invented in 1845 by Dr. Edward Maynard to increase the firing rate of muzzle-loading firearms. Now, with a percussion lock firearm, you would first pour your powder down the barrel, ram down your ball with a ramrod, and then you would cock back the hammer and place a percussion cap, a little copper cylinder filled with mercury fulminate composition, on a hollow nipple which led down into the chamber. And when you pull the trigger, the hammer would come down, strike the percussion cap, and the resulting flash would travel down the nipple into the chamber and ignite the powder charge. However, this could be a very fiddly and slow process if you were, for example, a soldier trying to fire on the advance or a cavalryman trying to reload your weapon on top of a horse. And so Maynard came up with a system with a paper tape covered in mercury fulminate buttons so that instead of having to place one of these percussion caps on the nipple, all you had to do was cock the hammer and it would advance the paper tape to the next button. And while reportedly this worked very well and greatly increased the rate of fire for these types of firearms, unfortunately it was very susceptible to moisture, so you had to be very careful to keep the paper tape dry. And if any of this is sounding very familiar, that's because the same technology was later repurposed for use in toy cap guns. Now, one of the major drawbacks of using a percussion igniter in a safety lamp was that the bursting of the mercury fulminate button could potentially send hot sparks through the protective metal mesh, setting off a fire damp explosion. So in 1893, Carl Wolf patented a new type of friction igniter. And as before, this used a paper or cloth tape, but this time it was covered in paraffin wax. And instead of mercury fulminate, the ignition buttons contained phosphorus. And these phosphorus buttons would be torn open by a set of interleaving metal jaws connected to the plunger. And this provided a less violent, more gradual ignition and made the lamp safer. And that is what we are looking at here. So to remove and reload this, you push down on this retention spring and pull the whole unit out. You can then hinge open the front panel. And here you'll see the little pin around which the roll of paper tape would be wound, the spring that holds the paper tape in place, then the little interleaving steel jaws operated by the plunger that tear open the phosphorus ignition buttons. And Freeman und Wolf developed and sold six different types of friction igniter until 1912, when they finally switched over to the more efficient ferrocerium flint and sparker wheel system. Now, another more minor difference between this and a traditional oil-fired lamp is that the fuel reservoir is packed with cotton wool to absorb the fuel and convey it to the wick, rather like in a Zippo lighter. And in this particular example, the wick is raised and lowered by turning this knob on the bottom. But by far the most interesting design detail on this lamp is this little device here on this post. And this is used for the detection of fire damp. Now, as I mentioned in my previous video, in addition to providing illumination, safety lamps were also widely used for detecting and safely burning off fire damp. And the telltale sign of the presence of fire damp was the formation of a blue cap on top of the flame. 
However, this could be very faint and difficult to see, especially compared to the bright oil flame. And the traditional way of dealing with this was to crank down the wick to reduce the luminosity of the flame and to make the cap easier to see. However, this risks stuffing out the flame entirely and forcing you to reignite the lamp. So all sorts of inventors came up with a variety of different systems to make fire damp detection easier and more sensitive. One of the earliest was the Peeler lamp introduced in 1883, which burned alcohol instead of oil or benzene. This produced a clearer and hotter flame, which made it much easier to detect methane. An improvement upon this was the Chesno lamp invented in 1892, which added methylene chloride and copper chloride to the fuel in order to tinge the methane cap a bluish green, making it even easier to see. A similar system was the Briggs lamp, which stretched a fine copper wire across the flame. This not only whipped away a lot of the heat from the flame, making it less luminous, but also tinted the flame a blue-green, just like the Chesno lamp did. Unfortunately, alcohol fuel safety lamps had one major disadvantage, which was that alcohol vapor could easily accumulate inside the lamp and ignite, setting off an explosion. And so there were a number of designs developed that had an auxiliary alcohol burner, that would only be turned on for a few minutes at a time in order to test for fire damp. Now, a slightly different approach was taken by the Beard Mackey lamp of 1912, which had a ladder of small platinum loops, which would heat up to incandescence when touched by the methane cap. And this allowed you to measure the extent of the cap, even if you couldn't see it clearly. Even more innovative was the 1920 Fleissner Singing Flame Lamp, which mounted a hollow resonator above the flame so that when the flame elongated in the presence of fire damp, the lamp would sing. It would produce a telltale tone. And finally, as I discussed in my previous video, the 1912 Klaus Lamp introduced the use of hydrogen gas fuel, which burns with a nearly transparent flame and makes methane that much easier to see. And that finally brings us back to this, which is known as a Cunningham Cadman device, which was invented in 1909 by Sir Henry Cunningham of the British Home Office and John Cadman, professor of mining at the University of Birmingham. And this consists of an asbestos wick in a holder with a knob that allows you to swing the wick in and out of the flame. Now, this wick would be soaked in a solution of bicarbonate of soda, aka baking soda. And just like the previous systems that we've looked at, the idea was to color the methane cap and make it easier to see. Though in this case, since the solution contains sodium, it would color the cap yellow rather than blue-green as in the previous copper-based systems. And when testing for fire damp, you would open up this rotating shutter, allowing air and fire damp to come in through the bottom, a feature introduced on the Chesno lamp. And so those are some of the surprisingly fascinating details built into this Wolf safety lamp. Now, when I published my previous video on safety lamps, I thought that I'd covered the technology fairly thoroughly, but it turns out there is a whole rabbit hole, or I guess mine shop, left to explore on this topic. And since now I own three of these, I guess that officially makes me a collector. And if I come across any more of these with more fascinating design details worth talking about, I will definitely feature them in future videos. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more safety equipment and other fascinating devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.